hey, this is a cool church. Motorbikes in church, wow, that's something. I tell you what, if anybody was dozing off, that woke them up. There's just no doubt about it. And as Jeff said, that's one announcement I'm sure everybody got a hold of. It's good to be with you again this morning and to be able to share God's word with you. Um, as you know, we're going through the, um, the story of, uh, of Elisha as we find these stories in, in the word of God. Um, very exciting person, Elisha. As I mentioned the last time I was here, one of my favorite characters. And I like him just to remind you for two main reasons. The one reason is he's a very ordinary person. It wasn't like Elijah who was a prophet of fire, you know, calls down fire from heaven and it comes down, burns up the water, burns up the stones, burns up the wood and, 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 and the offering and everything else. And a little while later, when, when they want to arrest him, he calls down fire, boom, and there's a whole little uh, captain with his men that had come to arrest him sort of burnt out. He was, he was a very different kind of a guy. Um, and secretly in my heart, I wish that I could do that sometimes with certain board members. No, that's, <laughs> I take that back. That's not true at all. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, just as well that the Lord hasn't given me that ability. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd see a lot of sort of fried people walking around. <laughs> no, no. But the, um, you see, Elisha was, um, Elisha was a farmer. He was just an ordinary guy. He wasn't a graduate from the school of the prophets. He didn't have great theological insight and training. He was just an ordinary person. In fact, the first time we read of him in the Bible, he's, he's, he's plowing a field behind a yoke of oxen along with, um, with the other household servants. He was, he was a, just an ordinary guy. He didn't have any pretenses about him. And, and even when we see how God used him, God just seemed to use him in such ordinary ways. You know, there's, there's a, a fountain that was... Um, it wasn't giving good water, and he says, and they, they come and they say to him, listen, it's causing miscarriages and, and all kinds of things. Please help us. He says, bring me a new bowl. Put some salt in it. Just ordinary table salt, cerebos, or whatever they used in those days. And he throws it into the fountain. Problem solved. Isn't that amazing? Um, as uh, we were talking about that, that toxic food, a, a bit of flour, just ordinary stuff. Everybody's got flour in their kitchen just takes a bit of it, puts it in, and God uses that. You know, an and axe head is, disappears, and, and, and it's a borrowed one, and they're feeling bad about it, and he says, take a stick. Where did it happen? They say, it fell in the river over there. He said, take a stick and throw it in, and I just love the old authorized version for this account. It says, and the axe head did swim. Now, I can imagine this this, this iron axe head with little, I don't know, little hands sort of swimming up to the surface and they just bend in and they, and, and they take it out. You, you see, he was an ordinary guy through whom God did extraordinary things. And every single one of us can experience those same extraordinary things that God does through us because we're just ordinary people, aren't we? We're nothing special, we're just ordinary people and God wants to use every single one of us in exactly the same way. I want to speak to you this morning about the, the incident that happened at a, at a place called Dotham, and um, it's recorded for us in 2 Kings in chapter 6, and uh, we're, going to, we're going to read that together, and I hope somebody's looking where I put my glasses. You don't know how many times I put them down when I'm preaching, especially in, uh, in, in strange churches, and I don't know where it, with, and without my glasses, I can't see my glasses. I must... I must tell you this one story. One of the first things I do when I wake up in the morning is put my glasses on. And, um, and this one morning I woke up and felt on my, my the pedestal next to my bed and I can't find my glasses. So then I sort of wake up properly and, and I look and my glasses are not there. So I think, well, maybe during the night I bumped them off the pedestal. So I look down on the floor and my glasses are not there. So I wake my wife up and I say to her, listen, I've lost my glasses. Please help me find them. And um, I'll never forget, we had this, this uh, purple carpet in, in our room in those days. They're going back to 1973, incidentally. And here I am crawling around on this dark um, carpet trying to see my glasses, you know, carpet this far away from my nose because I can't see very well. And there's my wife crawling around with me looking for my glasses. She says, where did you put them? I said, I don't know. She said, look on the dressing table. Maybe you put them there. Did you leave them in the bathroom? I don't know. 
And, um, you know, and, and you know, we're going around looking. And I, I, get to the, I get to the dressing table and I, I look up and I see myself in the mirror. I've got my glasses on. <laughs> <clears throat> The, 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 the surprising thing is my wife didn't see that I had them on. <laughs> uh, I, I, that's one of the things that I like to remind her of from time to time when she calls me an old man. <clears throat> okay. Um, 2 Kings chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 8. It says, Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel. The man of God is Elisha. Beware of passing that place because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, will you not tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Verse 13. Go find where he is, the king ordered, so that I can send men and capture him. The report came back, he's in Dothan. Then send horses and chariots and a strong force there. And they went by night, and they surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early in the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those that are with them. And Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. We were singing just a few moments ago those words in that song, that last song that we sang um, about open our eyes. And this is, this is what Elisha prayed for his servant. And I've got a theory about why he prayed that, which I'll share with you in a moment. He said, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. What an incredible story. What an amazing thing to happen. He was a man who just heard so wonderfully from God that every plan that the king of, of Aram thought up against Israel backfired on him until eventually in despair he calls his people together and he says please just tell me who the traitor is just tell me and they said nobody's sitting here O king it's Elisha the prophet would you would you talk in 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 your most private place this guy knows and and he goes and tells the king and so the king did a, a thing that I think all kings would do. Say, so, right, go and fetch him. Get an army together and go and fetch him. So they got chariots and they got soldiers. And these guys were armed to the teeth. And they go at night and they surround the city of Dotham. And early in the morning, Elisha's servant gets up to go and make him his early morning coffee. And, um, and as he looks out over the, over the wall, he sees this army. And I don't know how he knew it, but he just knew that this army is there for Elisha. So he goes and he wakes Elisha up. He says, wake up, wake up, wake up. Sir, wake up, wake up. And Elisha, if he's anything like most men, sort of opens his one eye and says, what time is it? And he says, forget the time. There's an army outside there of Arameans. And they got chariots and they got weapons. And they're coming for you. He says, I asked you a question. What time is it? The guy says, it doesn't matter. The sun has just come up. He says, well, then let me sleep for another hour. Then come bring me my coffee and wake me up. Hey? And this morning I want two eggs for breakfast just because you woke me up early. And, and, and the servant says to him, he says, but master, you don't understand. We're in trouble. There's an army around us. And Elisha says, no, you don't understand. 
you don't understand that there are more, that the force for us is far, far greater than the force opposing us. And, and, and Elisha could see, I'm not going to have any rest, any rest at all. So in desperation, he prays and he says, Lord, please open this man's eye, eyes so that I can have a little bit of rest. And the Lord opens his eyes and he looks and all of a sudden he sees what was there all the time. A massive army of angels and chariots of fire, far outnumbering and, and much more powerful and far greater in strength than that puny little bunch of Arameans standing around there. You see, those Arameans might have had GBH in their eyes. You know what GBH stands for? Grievous bodily harm that they wanted to inflict on, on Elisha. But you see, what they didn't realize is that Elisha had Almighty God on his side. And, and God is, is just something else. You know, the story of Elisha starts, the story of his ministry starts at least, um, when Elijah was taken up into heaven. And Elisha, uh, Elijah asked him, he said, right, um, what would you like? me to bequeath to you. What would you like from me? I'm going to be taken one of these days, soon. God's going to come and take me. He's revealed that to me. What can I give you for your faithful service as a servant to me? And, and this man didn't hesitate. He said, I want twice the spirit that is upon you. I want it on me. And Elijah said, wow, that's a hard thing that you've asked for. But if you're around when I'm taken up, then, you know, you, you might just get that. And he was. And, and he takes the cloak, this, this mantle of Elijah falls down as Elijah is, is taken up into heaven. And he takes this mantle and he walks up to the Jordan River and he smites it with his words. He says, where is the God of Elijah? And, and that's kind of the name of the series. When, when we were sitting down as, um, as, as pastors and preparing this whole thing with Trevor before he went to overseas, uh, this was the thing that got us. Where is the God of Elijah? It's a valid question. It's a question for us to ask today. Where is our God? Uh, we, we live in a world and, and somehow or other there seems to be no difference between us and the people who are in the world. And the question we want you to start asking is where is the God of Elijah in my life? And, and the whole story of Elisha, right from the very first miracle he performs all the way through, is an answer to that question. Where is the God of Elijah? And, and Elisha lived it out. You, you know... <clears throat> Let me tell you this. It's uh, not part of this whole story of Dothan, but it is a part of Elisha's um, life. In, in around about chapter 8, somewhere around there, maybe even a little bit further, 10, 11, 12, probably somewhere around there. Um, just trying to remember what happens in each chapter. But, but he, Elisha eventually dies. And he's taken and he's buried. And they're having a funeral procession for him. Now, I spent some time in, in the South African Defense Force when about 100 years ago when I was a lot younger than what I am now. And um, I, I, re, I, um, I attended a number of funerals. I had a few friends that were killed and, um, and, uh, uh, in flying accidents and, and other things. Um, and the, we'd have these funerals. And a military funeral is an incredibly sad thing designed to be. You've got these side drums covered in black cloth, and, and they've, they don't have anything playing uh, for the procession. They put the coffin on a, on a, uh, on a gun carriage, and, um, and then they've got this sort of beat. It goes, doom, the whole bass drum, doom, tick, tick on the side drum, doom, tick, tick, doom, tick, tick, doom, tick, tick, and you're doing slow march to that. And I, I, can, I can see, um, I was in the Air Force when I first read this story, and it really struck me in this way. So I had this, this picture of a funeral procession. These people, and the Jews were great at funerals. They had people who specialized. They were professional mourners. 
Um, they used to get paid for mourning, and you'd ha- hire them to come to your funeral to put on a real mourning show. Yeah, it's a solemn thing, people wailing, and people crying, and tears all over the place, and great sadness, and, and here's this procession, and somebody at the back kind of looks over his, his shoulder, and he sees a marauding band of Moabites coming down the mountains. And they also had GBH in their eyes. And um, this guy says to the to the guy leading the procession, he says, I think we're going to need to speed up these proceedings. These guys are coming, and they're coming a lot faster than what we're moving away from them. And so they pick up the, the, the pace a little bit. Now, you know, instead of doom, tick, tick, it goes doom, tick, tick, doom, tick, tick. And eventually it's just going doom, 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 doom. And these little guys are scurrying along. And they, and they come along, and you can read it. It's in the Bible, I promise you. It's, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. Um, and... Um, and they come to this tomb and they take this body and unceremoniously, as fast as they can, you know, dust to dust, ashes to ashes, soul we release to the Lord, boom, and they throw him in. And this dead man falls into this tomb and it happened to be the tomb where Elisha had been buried. And, and the Bible says that when this man hit Elisha's bones, he came to life, just like that. And then he jumps out of the tomb. He says, hey, he looks and he sees these Moabites coming. He says, guys, wait for me. I don't want to die again. And they look at him and they take off. And he takes off after them. <laughs> you, you talk about world land speed records. The Guinness Book of Records doesn't have an idea of what has happened in the history of this world. But you see, what I'm trying to say is that this man, had such an anointing of God's Holy Spirit upon him that he was dead and he was buried. But the God of Elijah was still alive. He wasn't dead. He was still alive. And you see, it doesn't matter what happens in our lives. We have a God who's still alive. The only problem is we are inclined to focus on the wrong things. We just, we just don't always see it. You see, God is always very interested in what we see. It's, it's very interesting to me <clears throat> when, you, when you have a look at what God says to various prophets that have lived. For example, in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, it says, The word of the Lord came to me. That's Jeremiah speaking. What do you see, Jeremiah? What do you see? And Jeremiah says, I see a branch of an almond tree, he replied. And the Lord said to me, you have seen correctly. You're seeing well. I can use you as a prophet. And then a little bit further down um, in verse 13, the word of the Lord came to me again. What do you see? And then right at the end, towards the end of the book of Jeremiah, I think it's got 31 chapters in somewhere around there, a little bit more. Um, Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, In Jeremiah chapter 24, verse 3, it says, then the Lord asked me, what do you see? Do you see, Jeremiah? What do you see? And then uh, we read the same thing of Amos. Amos says in Amos chapter 7, verse 8, And the Lord asked me, What do you see, Amos? I want to use you. But I need to know what you see. And, and then again in verse, uh, chapter 8 and, and verse 2, he says, What do you see, Amos, he asked me. And in Zechariah, he said to me, Zechariah 4 verse 2, what do you see? Zechariah 5 verse 2, he asked me, what do you see? God is interested in what you see. Because what you see is going to determine the outcome of your life. And I want, to, I want you to think about this for a moment this morning. What do you see? How do you see yourself? How do you see God? How do you see your circumstances? How do you see your history? How do you see the things that have happened to you? Because these things determine what you see is going to determine the outcome of your life and whether you're going to live in victory or whether you're going to live in absolute defeat. You see, this servant saw something and you can argue any which way you like. What he saw was real. Those Aramean soldiers were real. Uh, they had genuine armor on. They had, they had uh, a genuine uh, command and instruction to come and arrest Elisha, and they were capable of doing it. You better believe that. The king didn't send a bunch of wimps. He sent soldiers, guys that were trained to do this very thing. 
And so what the servant saw was real. But that man would have lived in absolute fear. He would have spent the next few hours of his life looking for a place to hide because of what he saw. Elisha saw something else. Elisha saw God in the whole situation. Elisha saw the promises that God had given him to protect him and to look after him and to bring him through whatever circumstances would come his way. Elisha saw his life in the hands of God who had called him and appointed him and nobody could do him any harm. They had to get past Almighty God. And so for the next hour or so, at least he was going to sleep peacefully because of what he saw. He wasn't worried. And, and if you read on in the story in, in, um, uh, in 2 Kings 6, um, eventually goes down to these guys and, and um, uh, he says to the Lord, he prays and he says, Lord, just blind their eyes for me, please. And uh, he gets down and there they've got their identity kits and they're looking at it and they look at this man that comes out to speak to them. And he says, <clears throat> he says, you're in the wrong place, the wrong city. Follow me and I will take you to myself. Don't read it. That's what he said. I'll take you to the man that you're looking for. And he was the man they were looking for, and he knew it. And, and these guys followed him. And he gets, takes them into Samaria. And they've got this complicated gateway, gateway through the walls of Samaria. And they get him right in the center of Samaria. And he says, right, Lord, you can open their eyes now. And the Lord opens their eyes, and they realize, Whoa, we are in trouble. We're in big trouble. Yes, the, this was the capital city of, of Israel at the time. And here are all the Israelites. All the, the Israelite soldiers, they're standing there with their, with, their, with their archers and their spears and their, and their stones and everything else. And they are up on top of walls and these guys are in an open space down the bottom. And the, and the king is there. And he says to Elisha, can I kill them? Can I kill them? Typical king, eh? Politicians always want to kill everybody. But, but yeah, can I kill them? Can I kill them? And Elisha says, no, we're not going to kill them. We're going to feed them. And so they organize a feast for them. And it says that when they'd eaten and when they'd had something to drink and, and, um, and they were satisfied, he sent them on their way. And the Bible says that there were never again any marauding bands of Arameans coming against Israel. They stopped. The king realized it's not going to help me at all. These guys are all pro-Israel now. Let's not push the thing too um, too much. You see, God has got a different way of doing things. And Elisha had a different way of doing things because he saw things differently. How do you see yourself? How do you see yourself as a Christian? You know, there's, um, there's this, this wonderful scripture in, in the Bible in, in, um, um, in 2 Corinthians and this is what it says. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Do, do, you, do you see yourself in that way? Uh, Paul writes to, to the Romans, and, um, and he says this, In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not allow sin to reign in your, in your mortal body. Um, so that you obey its evil desires. And then in verse 14, he says this. He makes a statement. He says, For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. How do you see yourself in relationship to sin? Are you winning the, 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 the victory over it, or aren't you? Now, um, I want to make a statement. Um, I want to make it quite clear. I don't believe in sinless perfection. But I do believe that God has made it possible for us not to sin. Did you hear me? I believe that God has made it possible through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. He's made it possible for us not to sin. And God doesn't want us living in sin all the time. He wants us to live with a bit of victory in our lives. God has built that fighting spirit into us. He wants us to stand up and, and to take the devil by the scruff of the neck because Jesus Christ has won the, the victory for us and to enforce it. Uh, Larry Christensen uh, wrote a, a book many years ago called The Renewed Mind. Most of you probably never heard of Larry Christensen. He was a Lutheran preacher and, and uh, I had the privilege of meeting him once and 
um, he actually gave a, a little bit of a modern parable. He said there was a man who, who rented a, an apartment from a terrible landlord. This guy was a real misery. He was a horrible chap. The rent was always going up. You could never afford to live there. And, and he would walk in and, and, he, and he would smash the, the lights in the lounge and say, why are those lights broken? I'm charging you for this. And, and this poor man's life became an absolute misery. And then one day, a person came to that apartment and said, I've bought this building. It now belongs to me. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to clean this apartment of yours up. I'm going to repaint it. We're going to refurbish it. Um, I'm going to fix everything up that's broken. And, and here's the good news. You're going to live here rent-free. I tell you, you can live here rent-free. And, and the guy was overjoyed. But at the end of the month, there's a knock on the door and, and he goes and he's so happy with the new arrangement and he opens the door and here's the old landlord and he shouts at him. He says, pay my rent, give me my rent. I want my money and I want it now. And if I don't get it now, I'm going to bring my, my mob in and they're going to beat you up and, and all the rest of the guy gets such a fright he pays. And later on, the original owner comes around and, he's, and he says, how's it going? So he says, man, this old landlord came around and, and he demanded money from me and I gave it to him. And he says, you didn't understand what I told you. I own the building. You do not have to pay. You don't owe this man anything. And I'm telling you, you can live here rent free. And you see, the point that he was trying to get across with this parable is that sometimes this is what happens to us. We, we get so used to having lived according to the dictates of our flesh and, and sin and everything else that sometimes, you know, when the devil just comes and makes a big shout and, and, a, and a noise, we just do it. I'll never forget, I was in my 20s at the time, and I was bound by a habit that really bothered me. And I knew it wasn't right, and I wasn't proud of it, and I really didn't want anybody to, to know about it. And, and I'd go and I'd pray, and I'd ask the Lord to deliver me, and I would fail time and time and time again. And then one morning, I was just having my, my devotions, and, and you know, guilt was eating at me, and, and my, my whole sense of, of self-worth was 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 tanking because uh, I just, I, I mean, what kind of a Christian am I? What kind of a testimony am I to all the other guys around me? Well, I can't get this victory. And, and I was reading in the Bible, and, and, and I read that portion of Scripture in, in Romans chapter 6, verse 11. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin but alive to God. Count yourself. Think of you, yourself as that. Consider yourself. Change your thinking, Hartley. Change it. You're alive to Christ. You're, not, you're no longer dead in sin. Jesus Christ has come and he's made you alive. That's the whole significance of your baptism. And then he, then he goes on and he says, Therefore do not allow sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. The Lord was saying to me, Errol, choose. You choose, but don't make excuses. You choose. You have the right to choose. I give you the right to choose because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary for you. And then he goes on in verse 14 and he says, For sin shall not be your master because you are not under law but under grace. My dad was in the ministry. I grew up in a pastor's home. I've never seen my father drink, never saw him smoke, never heard him swear, never heard him shout at my mom, not once. Never heard him being rude to anybody. I had a wonderful upbringing from that point of view. And I thank God for that. Um, I grew up in a home where swearing just was non-existent. My dad wouldn't allow us to go to movies because there was bad language and, 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 and various other things associated with it. So I went to the Air Force before I went to see my first movie. Um, and I thought that they'd put up that six-foot barbed wire fence all around so that I could do those things without nobody knowing about it. <laughs> Um, which wasn't quite true, but anyway, you see, and, and I went to a few movies and I decided my dad was right anyway. What's, 
what am I sitting here watching this rubbish for anyway, you know? And, um, but the, the, the point that I'm trying to make is uh, I wasn't a person that used bad language. Never, ne never in my entire life. I haven't been a person who swears. I've always thought that a person who, um, who has to use foul language is linguistically challenged. There are plenty of words that you can use that are more descriptive and more insulting than a swear word that everybody uses and applies to just about everything under the sun. So I suddenly realized when I read Romans, that, Romans 6 that, that the devil had lied to me. He deceived me, thinking that I was in bondage when Jesus was saying all the time, don't allow it to happen, Errol, I set you free. And I got angry with him. Man, I got angry with him. And I wanted to say something bad to him. And I'm, I'm trying to think, and I don't know any swear words. So I can't even think of one to say. Eventually I said to him, devil, foot sack. That was about the worst thing that I could say to him. But listen to me. He foot sacked. That was the last time I battled with that thing. It's not the last time that I failed. It's not the last time that I gave into it, but it was the last time that I felt guilty about it. And every time, if, if I did fail, if something went wrong, I'd just get down on my knees and I'd confess it to the Lord and i accept my forgiveness and I'd tell the devil, just because I did it once doesn't mean that you've bound me. I'm free. Jesus sets me free. As Paul said, wrote to the Galatians, in Galatians chapter 5, I believe it is, and in verse 1 he says, it's for freedom that Christ has set you free. In John chapter 1, John chapter 2, and, and in verse 1, John writes to the, to the believers and he says, I write these things to you who believe so that you do not sin. But if we do sin, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous, who pleads on our behalf. Isn't that wonderful? You, you see, God wants us to live in a different kind of a way. But I'm asking you this morning, what do you see? What do you see? What are you looking at? Do you just see all this failure? Do you just see all this weakness? Do you just see all this old life? Do you just see things that never seem to change? Then I want to suggest to you this morning, on the authority of God's word, you're looking at the wrong thing. You're not seeing what Jesus did for you on the cross. You're not seeing the power of the blood. You're not seeing the power of the Holy Spirit that, that can dwell in you and set you free from all these things. What do you see? in your life. Where is the God of Elijah in our lives? God wants us to live differently. That much I know. I haven't arrived yet. I'm still, i still got a little way to go. Um, but I'm not giving up. And I want the Lord to help me to focus my eyes. Can I read one last scripture to you? Um, in, in closing, it's in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It's just come to me right now. Um, uh, Paul writes this from verse 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore, do not lose heart. Though inwardly we are wasting away. Sorry, that's wrong. Though outwardly we are wasting away. My kids draw my attention to that rather regularly these days. Now, outwardly, we are wasting away, yet inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary or transient. It's going to change. But what is unseen is eternal. What God says about you in his word, you better believe it's true. What you see around you in the world is going to change. Everything is going to change. Have you noticed that? Just look at yourself in the mirror if you don't believe me. <laughs> Pick up a photograph of when you were a teenager. You know, ladies, when you won that sort of beauty contest or something when you were 18, have a look at yourself. You've changed, <laughs> unfortunately. Some of you changed for the better. Some of you, well, you know, it's debatable. <laughs> like me, you know, okay? But are, are, are you with me? Don't focus on the things that change. 
Focus on the things that never change. God never changes. His word never changes. His promises never change. Don't look at the, the armies, the, the things that challenge you. Focus on God. That's what we need to know. Paul writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 1, and he says, this is my prayer for you, that you might have a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know God better. <laughs> and we, we need that. We need that revelation. We need the Lord to open our eyes so that we can know him better. And then he goes on and he says, we also need to know the, the immeasurable power towards us. We were singing in one of the songs this morning that immeasurable power that God makes available to us. We're not using it, are we? Let's say, Lord, give me that spirit of revelation and of wisdom so that my life can be different. Let's pray. Lord, we just bow our heads together in your presence. You're a wonderful God. You have a wonderful word and and you've done absolutely incredible things for us through your son on the cross of Calvary. And we're just so thankful that you've called us. Lord, I just pray that you would give us a spirit of revelation this morning. A spirit of wisdom and so that we can see things differently. That's what we're asking you for. And just in a moment, just, I, I just want you to ask yourself where you are. What are you seeing right now? What are you seeing? Are you seeing God in every aspect of your life? Are you seeing God in control? Or are you just seeing a life that's falling apart and going nowhere? Because I think if that's the case, you need to change your focus. Okay? And if you just want to say to the Lord this morning, Lord, help me to see what you want me to see. Open my, the eyes of my heart so that I might see things differently. If that's what you're saying this morning, don't you just want to raise your hand just quickly, just as a sign. Lord, I've heard what you've said, and I'm responding. You can put your hand down again. I'm not interested in who it is. The Lord knows your heart, and the Lord knows why you're raising your hand. Now, I want you to trust God this morning, just to help you to see things differently. Will you do that? Lord, I pray for these people that have raised their hands. I don't know them all. You know every single one of them. And you know why they responded this morning. You know what you've said to them, and you know what you want them to do. And I just commit them to you right now in a simple prayer of faith. Lord, be with them and help them in Jesus' name. Amen.